three, two, one. Everybody. So we're back with another episode of the Swift Podcast. So today I bring on a special guest, um, Dr. Jacob Harden, based out in Orlando, chiropractor, phenomenal movement coach. Um, I've been watching and following his work for since I've started PT school since 2016. And I've reached out to him a few times with specific, specific questions of injuries that I've had. And like, I've always remembered the guy that's helped me through the times I've needed. And he's always been one to just, you know, you have a lot of celebrities out there that have fans, but he took his time to reach out, answer my questions and always remember that. Um, so to have him on here is a huge honor. So Dr. Jacob, welcome. Thanks um, for having how me. How are on, you man. today? How's everything? I'm good. Going? I'm good. Yeah, I'm so, good. I know we were briefly talking, so you're in the mix of travels and um, I read your questionnaire and so forth, but let's let's kind of get right to it. So first of all, welcome. How's everything going? Family's well. Everything's well. Yeah, everything's pretty good. Um, running the running the clinic. Haven't been teaching a whole lot in the yeah. past year. Your um, second clinic, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, second, as in the second installment of. I only have one clinic, but it's kind of my the second go round with it. Awesome. But yeah. Awesome. So second go around, meaning you're just kind of revamping the, 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 the platforms a little bit. Yeah, we had, um, so we had a clinic in the Northern part of Orlando, uh, for three years and then lease was up on that place. So we kind of let that lease expire. I took a year off to get the teaching thing rolling. Um, and then we opened up this second clinic more towards the downtown south side of Orlando Ooh. as a way to kind of get a little bit closer to our patients. So we've been running that for about two years now. That's awesome. And things are going well. COVID didn't yeah. really impact you guys much, did it? Uh, I chose to close the clinic for a few months, um, which it I jumped into telehealth pretty hard with okay. that. So it, it was fine in that sense. I stayed busy. Um, but you know, we're back at it now. There you go. Well, that's good to hear. So I know we had a few questions and a few topics to kind of go over today, and we're just going to kind of go with the flow, but kind of enlighten people on what a chiropractor does and what you do as your specialty. I think there's a lot of, a lot of myths out there of what you do and don't do. And I want you to kind of clear that out real quick. Cause I know what you're doing is what people don't think you do, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess up front, I'll say that like, I probably don't practice the way most people would view Cairo. Um, so Cairo's are doctors who kind of specialize in musculoskeletal injuries. And you know, the, I would say a lot of the profession puts the majority of its emphasis into back and neck pain. Um, I, that we definitely, we can treat way more than that. And I have expanded that, you know, well beyond that. Um, the, you know, at OSR, Orlando Sports Rehab, which is my clinic, we kind of take an education and active approach first as our primary treatments. Um, and that has, you know, that's just kind of what I've seen as being the uh, best care in terms of what the evidence says we should be doing. Um, so, so that's where I go. Um, but I think a lot of people probably think, when they think Cairo, they probably think adjustments or spinal manipulation. Um, and that's definitely the reputation the profession has, but there, there's a much wider scope of practice than that. And uh, that's what I've kind of chosen to utilize a little bit more. So talk to me about your vision. What did, led you to kind of branching off the typical care line, right? So like you said, initially, when I think chiropractors and physical therapy, we take exercise and so forth. But I think chiropractors adjustments, a little bit of manual, gets you out the door and the next person comes in. But you took that to a different level. So you're combining multiple avenues. So where was your mind at making that happen? I know you mentioned a little bit of our research and so forth, but what drew that to really get you going? when I, when I think chiropractors. Yeah. So when, 
when I think chiropractors, I'm thinking, manip- like you said, right, manipulations, just a quick manual in there. But you took that to a whole new level. So what drew that mindset for you? What was the, the turning factor saying, you know what, I want to do this instead of what the, I guess, go by the book in a sense, you know? Uh, well, you know, I have this wide scope of practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like everything's there to use. So I don't, I don't equate the profession to a therapy. Okay. And I think that's actually a big problem with the profession is that we tend to define ourselves by this one therapy because it's what makes us different. It's what, you know, separates us from the PTs in a sense. So the argument I always hear, uh, and I don't think that we need to separate I don't feel, feel that I need to separate myself from anyone at, by therapy that I do. I'm gonna separate myself by just being really damn good at my job. And so for me, it's like, all right, we have this wide scope. What is gonna be best for this individual in front of me? And I just look, I kind of view care as more of a problem solving expedition than it is uh, I'm here to fix you. Like I like that's a technician job, you know, like I want to be a clinician. And so what kind of, I guess what kind of led me down that route was seeing, all right, people are coming in with active problems and we need to like a passive intervention is probably not the solution to that. Um, I've been an athlete my whole life and I like, that's who I'm working with is other active individuals. And so helping someone kind of get back to that kind of active approach while I would say early in my career, we were in, we were using a lot of the passive therapies that we learned in school, but we were, and we we're kind of dabbling in a lot of the, the active approach with it. You know, somebody would come in with back pain when they're squatting, we might do some manual therapy and give them an adjustment. And then we would go over to the squat rack that we had in the office and we'd have them start squatting and kind of look at that. Um, and kind of as a, a younger clinician, I kind of did put a lot of those classic therapies first in the treatment. It's like, oh, that's that's the treatment. That's what they're coming here for. And yeah. then we go and do some active care stuff at the end that was I was prescribing as a home exercise program. Um, over time and seeing more people, and it's like kind of I develop my way of thinking. Um, and as I learn more, I start to realize, you know, I don't know how much this other stuff we're doing first is necessary versus like what we're doing to get the patients kind of working towards their own goals. Um, and I started to kind of see that like the, the active stuff we were doing probably had a lar- much larger effect than the passive stuff. Um, and so that, that shift over time happened where I eventually just started to phase things out to the point now I've probably done two to three adjustments in the past year. Um, and that was because patients requested them. Uh, Uh, but my whole, like my whole business model has shifted around that to where now I see patients maybe once a month to once every six weeks and do. And in the meantime, you know, the, the care is really centered around helping them identify where the problem is and what the path forward is going to look like with developing a plan and a program for them to kind of get working on with that. That's awesome. And I love what you said there about the manipulations. I only did them when the patients, that was going to be a question I was going to talk to you about, like manipulations. We always get in the clinic too. Hey, can you, can you adjust me real quick? And I always find like for patients and I'm, I'm two years into practice right now. I'm fairly new into the industry. Um, I spent a lot of time in strength and conditioning. I'm just like, you're just not there. You don't need it. You need to move better. You just need to, to get there, especially with my acute injuries. Um, and that's something you and I want to discuss, like for acute injuries, a lot of times people come to the clinic, like, Hey, I had this issue. My back hurts. I just want you to crack it, adjust it and get me out of the door. And I'm like, that not, that's not the solution. This is what we need to do. So, um, Let's kind of dive into your thoughts on acute injury. So let's go a little back pain of what the more common causes of those back pains are. And with acute injuries, what is your, I guess, treatment philosophy or treatment go-to in a sense? Well, you know, I think that we have to, (laughs) we, we need, we need to recognize that, you know, when somebody's asking, say for, let's just say any sort of therapy that's primarily centered around symptom management. Because yeah. it's really, we can put all these things into a big, under a big umbrella of, you know, our manipulations, our manual therapies, our e stems, all that stuff can kind of go under this big umbrella of, hey, this is to help kind of make your symptoms better. Okay. Um, 
make things more tolerable for you. And I think as long as we're framing it that way, I really don't have a problem with any of it. Um, where I kind of get, uh, where we kind of get into the weeds with it is if we start to frame those things as having some like there some corrective effect on them. Like there's something wrong with you, which is why you have this pain and this therapy is fixing this about you. Um, and without it, you won't get better. I don't think that's true at all. You know, we've seen natural history is a very powerful thing. Yeah. And so, but with that, like I'm, I'm currently dealing with sciatica at okay. the moment. So like, I'm like, I'm going to be all fidgety in my chair, but there have been days over the past, I've been dealing with this for the past month. There have been days over the past month that like, man, stuff just hurts. Like, and it, and it hurts bad. Like, I don't want, I'm limping and I can't, I don't want to walk around very much. And so I'll find myself, you know, I'll like dig into my glute where it hurts, you know, and I'm like, I'm modifying those symptoms. And that helps me kind of just walk around and get along with my life. And I think in that acute stage, especially where pain has the largest impact on our life and our daily activities the most, you know, there's a place for those things, but it has to be framed within a bigger picture. It's not the solution. It's something that can help you kind of keep moving, help you kind of just help you keep getting along because where we might go wrong is we start to prescribe these things as like, uh, you need to get your adjustment three times a week or you're not going to get better. Right. I, I don't know if, if something is just purely symptom modification, I don't think that there is a rhyme and a reason for why you prescribe it other than the patient feels like they want it, need it, you know, or things are just beyond what's tolerable for them. So they're asking for it. Um, and so that's why, like what I'll say, like when it, I've done manipulations, whenever patients basically ask for them, because I don't prescribe them on any sort of frequency. So like, Hey, if you feel like if things are ramping up a little too much, here's a strategy you can use. It's the same thing I tell somebody to use their foam roller at home. Um, what we don't want to do, though, is ignore maybe some of the bigger factors in that acute phase, which is like, what are the provocative activities that could end up perpetuating the cycle and prolonging that cycle? So if we have somebody with back pain, for example, um, and let's say they're an active individual who wants to go hit the gym and they're trying to work out through this, which we would love for them to be able, we would love for them to do, right? Stay active. But they're getting this back pain and every time they go and let's say they squat or deadlift or do any sort of hinging motion, um, it kind of flares them up and their, their pain kind of, it's like they feel a little good, they do a little something and then their pain spikes up again. And they feel, it kind of comes down, they do something, they spike it up again. And they start to kind of perpetuate this cycle by constantly reflaring. With And we call someone like that an, an endurance coper with their pain. Um, if someone like that might take a, the, the fix, right. The fix therapy of modify, take this therapy, modify the symptoms, pull the symptoms down until I feel good. And then they go and do the thing and re, re aggravate. So then they come get the therapy, they feel good. Then they go and they re aggravate. So we need to lay this foundation first, which is, Hey, here's the things that might aggravate here. And here's kind of where you, what you can tolerate the activity level you can tolerate the loads you can tolerate. We need to establish where that threshold is first. We need to establish the lifestyle that you're going to have to lead in the presence of this pain for a minute, because this pain is going to be with you for a minute and yeah. you're going to need to learn how to live with it. We need to establish that first. If you have that, and I say and say like, that's doing the stuff you need to do. And then if you want to throw some cherries on top with like, hey, things are going to hurt every now and then, and you can do something to kind of keep you chugging along in that process, totally fine. Um, to kind of give my own example here with my, this leg, yeah. it, a long walk will hurt. Uh, like I can walk about a three quarters of a mile to a mile, pretty good. After I kind of start to limp a little bit, um, so if I were, to, but I normally have like a two, two and a half mile routine that I would do if I wasn't dealing with this. So if I was to just kind of push through this two and a half miles and you're like, I'm going to go limp my way through the back mile and to, to the point that I now have to go and I have to take pop Tylenol and lay down for the next two hours. How productive is that? 
yeah. you know, that's probably not that productive. And if I'm doing something to artificially manipulate my symptoms down to a level that I then go do that, so then I just reflare myself back up, you're probably starting to ride this roller coaster. Um, so upfront care looks a lot like educating them of what's going on, helping them understand probably what's going on, um, all the ups and downs they might have to go through here, um, and really get helping someone like get re- de-threatening the situation a lot of times because acute pain is it's a whole other animal because it's intense, it's very limiting, um, it takes a psychological toll on you. So that kind of comes first then kind of identifying like, Hey, where are you struggling? What's where are you having problems? Because a big part of like my care is helping you maintain this sense of normalcy in your life. Um, And we kind of lay that foundation of, Hey, here's probably what you need to modify. Here's where we can kind of pull back a bit. And here's where we're going to be able to kind of push forward a little bit. And then after all that's in place, okay, let's see if there's anything we can find which will help modify those symptoms in the event that you need that. Um, Whether that is some manual therapy or jumping on your foam roller or some stretches or a movement routine or some in-range loading or whatever, all of it can work. Um, And then if you have a clinic which utilizes more of those like feel-good symptom modification therapies, then maybe that becomes, uh, maybe you're there as a resource for them as well to be able to manage that. But, you know, I'm not, that's not a big part of my clinic and that's not part of my business model. So I don't tend to be there. I tell my patients that they're more than welcome to give me a call and I'll happily help them there because I have the ability to. Um, But it's not something that we like prescribe and say, you like, I want you in here this many times a week to get these therapies yeah, because ultimately it's all the other stuff you're doing in your life, which is going to have the biggest impact. Absolutely. And I like the, the address and kind of hone in the first part of it is educating the patient of what's going on. I think a lot of clinicians, even myself, as I'm learning more and more, so I'm pursuing an orthopedic residency now, and we just go back of like, education can go very far. And if you educate properly, that itself is enough to start making the patient start to think a little bit better for themselves. Like, hey, I'm going to start doing this less. I always tell my patients, well, they're like, well, this hurts, this hurts, that will just don't do that for a little bit. Let your tissue relax, and especially with acute. I always find that calming, and calming the tissue down a little bit, letting them rest is going to be a huge component for their success. Um, so how'd you get the sciatic pain? I'm just kind of curious. Where did that start? <laughs> and it, it's, the, it's, it's the weirdest thing. Um, so I honestly don't know exactly how it all started. Um, yeah. And I don't care to honestly know because yeah. uh, I don't think it has a big impact on what I do moving forward. But I noticed maybe three months ago, I just had a lot of trouble hip hinging. I would get this deep pain in my glute. Um, No radiating pain, no nothing. Um, Just this deep pain in my glute. And then I would wake up in the morning, my back would be really stiff, um, stuff like that. And then uh, probably a month ago, I had a deload week in my training. I was like, all right, well, you know what? It's deload week. I'm not doing as I have plenty extra time here. So I'm just going to do some stuff here to see if I can get my ability to hinge a bit better. Maybe I'll focus on that. Yeah. And so I like, I was doing some um, extra, I was just doing some exercises that kind of put the sciatic nerve on a little more tension, just kind of dynamically moved in and out of it. Next day, woke up, my hip was aching to like all, like it was just aching like no other and never really stopped. <laughs> um, so I, I pissed something off, pissed something off real yeah. good. And, um, you know, didn't think too much of it. So it wasn't too bad. And you know, then I went out and I was like doing some cable rows and I le- like leaned forward to re-rack the weight. And I got this like nice shooting pain up into my back. And I was like, oh, 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 that's, that's not fun. No. Um, and then from there, the symptoms just kind of been up and down. It's like my out, my little pinky toe has gone numb at times. My calf has felt like it's run, ran a marathon. I've gotten pain in my glute. I've gotten pain down my outer thigh. It's been all over the place but objectively i'm much better like i can walk around a lot more i can roll over in bed a lot easier so while the symptoms have kind of been crazy the the function's getting better there you go i'm on my way 
<laughs> and for those of you who don't know, sciatic pain is probably one of the more common pains we see in the clinic. Um, massive nerve runs down the leg. It happens. It starts at pierce at the butt, works its way down. You'll get sharp tingling, numbness, the whole nine yards. And it's not fun. But I always laugh about it with my patients because people think therapists, chiros, and doctors are the most resilient to injury. No, we are human. We get hurt all the time. Um, I currently have a groin issue. I'm competing next weekend. And like, I, I, same thing. I was, I was going to deadlift. I went to hinge and just out of nowhere. I don't know what happened and where it goes, but like, it's naggy. So we'll deal with it when everything kind of comes into play. Um, and that's, how's that, like, when it comes to that in sciatic terms, what are you doing? So it's fairly acute a couple months out. Um, what did you do initially for those at, like, I guess for those who currently suffer with them that are listening to us, what would be your best recommendation for them? Uh, so one, I just didn't freak out about it, first of all. Like, and this is a, <laughs> you know, you've heard the phrase, you know, you prefer the, the devil that you know to the devil that you don't. And that's kind of what this situation has been. I would, as these symptoms kind of change, I feel like when my calf got so bad, it felt like my calf was strained or my Achilles wanted to rip off the bone. I'd be longing for the hip pain again. I'm like, oh man, I just take, I'll, I'll take the hip, you know? And then it started like radiating into my tailbone to my back. I was like, oh, you know, I, I'd rather have the calf with than this. And so, was, um, and that's something to think about. I think something I've seen personally that patients are a lot more apprehensive about the injury that they've never had before the first time injury it's like i you know if you've injured your knee the four times over you know the fourth time you get you feel that pain you're not as freaked out about it because you've kind of been through the cycle um but like the first time you injure your back it's like you're a little more guarded you're a little more apprehensive about it you don't know what the end of this looks like yeah um and so all that uncertainty And so you kind of have to remain calm and realize that a lot, part of how you feel here is the uncertainty, like, and that's the emotional aspect of the pain experience. And, you know, you start to kind of, you're playing the guessing game in your head of what's going on, what's going to happen. So the first thing I did was just didn't freak out. Um, I, I have the, I guess, benefit there of having worked with a number of people. So I, I know, I know how that's will go. Um, Then identifying aggravating activities, what can I do? And what really um, seemed to not, uh, not be tolerated very well was my second thing. And that's been, that was probably an exploratory process over about three weeks, because I've never dealt with this before. I've dealt with back injuries multiple times, uh, but never nerve related, a nerve related injury, especially going down the leg like this. And so for me, it was like, realizing this is much more irritable than anything I've ever dealt with, where a lot of the aches and pains I've dealt with, you know, you can, you can kind of just, you work with them, you push into the pain a little bit and it's okay. And you, you kind of, it chills itself out once you take the load off of it and you kind of progressively step your way up, you know, something like this has been like, if I touch the pain, man, it's going to stick with me and it's going to, it ramps, it goes zero to 60 real fast. And so I've had to figure that out. I flared myself up a number of times um, on this. And that's just a part, been part of the process where um, one day I went out to do step ups on a 12 inch box and I mean, I felt it in my glute. And if it was, if this was a muscle strain, I would have probably just like pushed through it the way I normally would. And I, I guess I made the mistake of pushing through it. Like it, like if it was a muscle strain um and then i was down and out for the next three days because it was just real real achy after doing that um so kind of explored how does this thing behave um how irritable is it what can we do and then i started to kind of establish some baselines one of the very first things i did was i made a spreadsheet and created a big list of every single thing i'm having that i'm struggling with and that I know to provoke it. So like if I were to pull up that list, it'd say things like um, walking provokes pain, rolling over in bed provokes pain, sitting on the couch provokes pain, um, a squat, and then a split squat, a step up, a knee, a knee uh, extension. You know, like I know all, so I have this big list of kind of things I can start to check off to yeah. say, all right, 
when am I objectively getting better? Because I know as I start to feel better, I'm going to get a little recency bias here. I'm going to start to compare how I felt three days ago to how I feel today and not compare how I feel today to where I was three weeks ago. Um, and I'm glad I did that because it's de I've definitely had my ups and downs with it. And that's part of the process. Uh, so I created this list, kind of started checking things off the list of all right, where, what are we doing? Um, and then my rehab, in a sense, as I've kind of figured this out, what I can do uh, has I've maintained my daily walks as best I can. I've had to shorten them a little bit and I'm definitely moving slower than I was before. Uh, but staying kind of within my threshold of where I kind of start to get a little limpy with it. Um, with my workouts, I've had to modify, I modified basically every exercise in my workout to not aggravate it. Um, haven't done a whole lot of lower body training in a while. It, uh, what I have done has been very light, like pin squats with an empty bar, just trying to work into the range of motion I can. Um, and grabbing the BFR straps and doing some, you know, BFR work where I can to help maintain my muscle mass because <laughs> I don't know how long this is going to go. I love BFR for that reason. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, in a situation like this, it works well. Absolutely. Um, and then, so trying to expose myself, expose myself to some of those provocative activities in graded doses as I'm able to, so that I can kind of start checking my boxes. Because my, my thought process is, all right, if here's everything that I'm limited in in my life, if I can check all those boxes off to the point I'm no longer limited, can I, do I even consider myself injured at that point? I don't. Um, so my rehab in a sense is getting myself back towards function. I'm confident that pain is going to resolve itself enough in that time frame that I'll be okay with it. Um, and eventually it'll go away because man, the, that's what it does. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love the fact- That's what it's that been. Yeah. And like, I love the fact that when I ask you about your injury and again, topic is acute injuries. You're not giving me like, well, I do these four exercises. No, you understand the injury. You're writing down what provokes it to avoid it. And then finding your threshold of optimize. I think that's one of the best thing, like, again, goes back to education, understanding what the issue is. So thank you for all that knowledge that you just dropped on us. And I like the spreadsheet idea. I really do. Cause I, I don't think about it. Like we don't realize on a day-to-day -day base, what continues to aggravate it. And especially with patients, they're always doing things. I'm like, you shouldn't have done that. But I, I, I feel like it's on me to remind you that, Hey, I should have told you to look out for those things. So I've been definitely putting that more as a young clinician to do it. Um, and I feel like this kind of carries over to what you're teaching. I know teaching is a big part and you're not doing as much of it. And you had a course, the one-on-one prehab course. So give us a good taste of what that course is like and what you're really putting out there. Cause I feel like you're putting out a lot of great knowledge from just this first half hour we've been talking. So give me some insight on that. This, um, VIP pass here. <laughs> yeah. So big principles thinking is honestly the way I see it. So we probably all, if you've ever asked the question, what's the best exercise for, right? the answer should almost always be, it depends, right? <laughs> but the, the thing I want to get into is it, well, it depends on what, right? Because that's an annoying answer. It depends on what. And really what that comes down to is understanding the principles of what you're doing. And so uh, prehab, start, uh, it's, it's changed a lot over the years. It started out as me talking a lot more around the, injury uh mitigation side of things so hence the prehab 101 uh name that came with it it shifted a lot more towards management of injuries um so it's just more like a rehab it's more of a rehab course now um the name's a bit of a misnomer <laughs> but i feel like the process is pretty is the same it's um identifying what this person can do who's coming to you in pain or with an injury, helping them build forward and then develop the capacity to return back to their life and hopefully with a reduced risk of re-injury in the future. And so in that we talk about uh, factors that lead to injury, what plays into that, uh, really getting into the weeds of you know all the different variables that could play into injury, such as, you know, built around a principle of like, okay, injury happens when load ex exceeds the adaptive capacity of the body, right? But what are all the variables that could play into that? How does movement play into that? How does load play into that? How does the shoes you're wearing, if you're a runner, play into that? Um, because it, it could matter. 
yeah. and it could matter in a sense uh, in a situation but what it to blatantly throw something out there like um running on a you know running with this shoe causes is causes more injuries than running with this shoe well, that's probably not going to play out very well in the literature right but if you look at it from well, this runner is used to running with this shoe and then all of a sudden they ran with this shoe and didn't alter their mileage at all, but it changed the way they're loading through their foot. That might have, that might be a variable. Um, so we start trying to talk a little more like causal models of injury, um, talk some pain, uh, the multifactorial nature of pain, the get a, a really hard in psychology, behavioral aspects. How do people respond when they're in pain? A lot of the behavior patterns that we see, um, because I think that's probably the, biggest factor that we're working with as clinicians and professionals that you know somebody's coming to us with um the fact they're coming to us for help means that they've probably exceeded their coping resources you know they, they they're needing help somewhere uh so we talk a lot of psychology how that's going to inform our exercise prescription um and then from there we kind of flip into kind of a programming strength conditioning side of things what are, how can you design better exercise programs? What are like load progression strategies you could use? Uh, how do you mix that in with everything else we've just talked about? Uh, and then we put it all into some practical applications with resistance training, plyometrics, aerobic conditioning, uh, kind of throwing that in with some different injuries that you might see, uh, kind of wrapping it all up so that we take a big picture view and try and pull it down into some really applicable strategies. That's awesome, man. There's a lot going on in that, but yeah, I, there, yeah. I, I, I truly admire the, the psychology aspect of it. And you, you said you're looking at psychology to create program designing and influencing change in, in those aspects. So what are examples of some good questions you're asking your, I guess your, your clients and patients to allow you to start turning your mind saying, listen, I want this question answered. because It's going to help me guide towards that. Right. So when we talk to you about like your injury, I'm going to ask a specific question like, Hey, what happened? And in and, and doing so, what in that hinge, something was altered, we missed something, and then we can design that. So what are some examples that you're doing? Oh, I guess a okay, question so, in a sense. Yeah, so I try and figure out how have they, how has this person reacted to being in pain? Okay. Okay, like what, what behavioral response did they get from this? And if we probably should start by creating some sort of, um, ideal scenario of what we would feel would be an adaptive response to pain. And so if we think about that, it's probably you back off a little bit from aggravating activities, but you don't get overly fearful of it. And as things start to calm down and as you're able to, you gradually push your way back into some of those provocative activities. A lot of things I talked about with that I'm doing here, that's what I view as like an adaptive response. So how a maladaptive response then is probably something that deviates wildly from that. And so we'll tend to see um, a few different behavioral patterns. You might see somebody that becomes very avoidant, um, avoidant of activity. And that could be due to the fact that they have seen that whenever they try to be active, it flares them up. And when they rest, they feel better. And so it's a learned behavior. Um, it might be that they become apprehensive and fearful. And that's why they're avoiding a lot of the avoiding exposing themselves and they're missing that exposure point. They're kind of gone really hard into the pullback situation. Um, might be because they have the big biomechanical, biomedical explanation and they're worried about making it worse. I'm trying to pull that out. If I'm getting the sense that that's the, um, the path they've taken, then I'm trying to pull out maybe like, why are you doing that? Yeah. Why did you go there? Um, and really, it's the simplest thing, like, what have you done? You know, what, what have you done since this has happened, you know? Like, and trying to letting them tell their story and then you can kind of pull it out. Other people, and I'll give some examples of my own patients here with these um, in a minute. Other people push to the other end and they are more that endurance persistence type of coper. And they are aggravate, aggravate, aggravate because they refuse to back off from things and they just push, 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 like nothing ever happened. And, you know, that, while well, the first person needed a little more like easing into the exposure side of things, the other person probably needs a little bit more of a drawing back, a little more load management in order to help them. Um, 
And then some, I, I guess the third major one that I see is kind of a cyclical pattern where it's that person who like, I feel good. So I do a lot of activity. I flare up. Once I flare up, I start avoiding everything until I feel good again. Then I have to go back and then we just over and over again. Um, and that person kind of needs to understand that the goal isn't necessarily to reduce their pain. Cause I see a lot of those people and they come to me actually, whenever they're feeling good, mm -hmm. looking for the exercises, that's going to make the pain go away. It's, and I have to kind of point out to them, like your pain's already gone away. You're not in pain, but you rec like you have a behavioral problem. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out how to stop this spike from happening. That probably means that we need to gradually reintroduce those activities and not go ham and not go zero to 60 on them. Um, so to give you an example there of each one, uh, I had one patient who was a hockey player and he would go and play hockey. His back would, his back would flare up on him. He would then just, uh, for about three days after that, he would just lay, lay around, rest, take muscle relaxers and anti-inflammatories until the pain that went away. And then he would go back and he would do hockey again. So cyclical persistence mm -hmm. cobra, right? But whenever we brought up resistance training, he was very apprehensive about doing any sort of like low back resistance training because he had kind of a fragile mindset around his back in that sense. So he was very, so he was avoidant there. Um, and so all that together starts to inform how we're going to develop this rehab program. We need to figure out some load management for the hockey. How do we, how do we do that? And so we used an SRPE scale for him and said, all right, any sort of like session RPE that you're rating as like hard and above, you mm -hmm. only skate for 30, 30 to 45 minutes. Anything below that you can then skate for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. That kind of got our load management under control, manage those provocative activities. Um, and then on the resistance training side, where he was a little more apprehensive, we had to take more of a graded exposure approach. And it's like, well, we're not going to go and just load up deadlifts, you know, with pushing you to failure on day one, because this isn't about making your back strong. Yeah. Like this, that's not what this is about. This is about exposure to stress and create and challenging the system. And so we started him with so like 95 pound block pulls and just let him get comfortable with going through that hinge motion with some load, rebuilding the confidence that he had in his back, and then gradually progressing the load up and progressing the range of motion down there to the point that eventually he was challenging the, the physical system more. He was challenging the physical side of things. But in order to challenge the physical side, we had to challenge the psychological side first. That is one intricate process that's amazing and you you see it because it's gonna if you start to do it properly it'll fit in for the best perfect circle i love that that is awesome man uh kudos to you and it's funny so this this lecture that in, in class that we're doing today so we're spending a lot of this week in my rency program looking at neuroscience and looking at neuroplasticity and now most of neuroplasticity principles they just care about in, in for physical therapy side just in in the neuro setting right the acute care setting but they're trying to make your mind change essentially and bring it to the outpatient looking at cognitive task and looking at all the, the principles of neuroplasticity for our outpatient setting for that reason of what you just said, behavioral change, but also understanding where they're at. Um, and one of the articles I was just reading earlier this morning, it was talking about recovery versus compensation, right? Compensatory strategy. So we look at recovery. What is your definition of recovery? So for me, when I think recovery, I'm thinking, okay, back to optimal movement without anything compensatory. And then we think compensation strategy, what are they doing? They're at recovery standpoint, but they've altered their mechanics to get there. So there's other things that they weren't doing prior to in compensation. They have related that to like stroke patients. Stroke patients go through this process and yes, they can become functional, but they have to go through all all these different movement strategies to make themselves functional because of the alteration and it's there's a there's a huge link of neuroscience that i feel like has just never been tapped into and i haven't come across a lot of um educators and clinicians that do it and this week for, it just happened to be that that's what we're learning in school um and that's what you're kind of talking about so it's kind of cool to see that and, and it makes perfect sense to me um 
And with that, folks, I know we spent the last 40 minutes with the most, again, educated episode you're going to get here. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to bring him back on for some more things for us. So we're back with Dr. Jacob Harden, who's been a delight for the last 45 minutes of educating us on acute injuries and corporeal injuries. So as per usual, I always send the guests um, questions to answer. And one of the questions that I had him answer was, what's his biggest passion? And also a little bit of background himself. And his passion was, as I quote, it was more of the process of mastering something and continuing to grow and continue to better himself. I followed his work since again, 2016. And I've seen that in his work online and his content. And overall, he's not your typical chiropractic doctor. He's doing amazing work. He's changing the norm in a sense, and he's chasing the ultimate dream, which is amazing. He's a father, he's a husband, um, he's, he's a patient for himself, we talked about, but those are all things that ultimately for us, it's hard to do. So as usual, he's gonna give us his three big tips for chasing the ultimate dream that's again, out of the norm. So the floor is all yours, sir. All right, so let's see, so three big tips here. Um, I think the first one is to just recognize that this is going to take time. This is, this is not coming overnight. There's going to be struggles along the way. You're going to have to figure it out. Um, and that's why you have to be process oriented. You can't be completely, don't be completely outcome oriented, be process oriented, fall in love with the process of getting better every single day. And, um, to kind of pull that back to our earlier conversation, right? Having kind of some, some steps, some things you're checking the boxes. Like how are you checking the boxes to know that you're on your way? Because if you're completely, if you get very outcome oriented and say like, it's all about this, this big grand goal that I'm after. Well, what if it takes you a decade to get there? Right? Like I'm seven years into practice and it wasn't until maybe two years ago that I could say like, I feel like, I, made, I feel like I made it here, you know? And so like, if it took me five, like that's a five year process to even get to the point that I start to feel there, feel that way. Um, and so you have to be figuring out ways to check the boxes and say, all right, I've, I've made some progress here. Um, fall in love with that process. Second tip uh, would be like, be prepared to wear a lot of hats. Um, you're gonna have to like this is not gonna it's not gonna be smooth sailing you're gonna have to be able to do a lot of things and like especially if you are chasing some sort of life goal <laughs> like like these are grand goals right like for me you said like you pointed out I am a clinician I'm a teacher I right now I'm an app developer I do social media I'm full-time stay-at-home dad on top of that my husband all all these things and like you have to figure out how you're going to balance this because there's 24 hours in the day regardless of how many hats you're wearing and you got to figure out how you're going to divvy up that time um because if you spread yourself too thin you're going to basically half-ass everything and that is a recipe for one, not making progress towards anything, but also starting to really disdain uh, the process that, because you feel like you're not getting anywhere and you're not getting anywhere because you're trying to do too much. And so like for myself, I was there, I was at that point and I had to pull back from things. That's why I haven't made a social media post in over a year, or almost a year now. Um, because I was at a point where I had to, I had too many things I was doing and I wasn't making progress on anything. And I was getting, I was just feeling stressed by everything. And because it was like, well, social with social media, I'm stressed about making content. And when I'm at, and then I'm stressed about the clinic. But when I'm at the clinic, I'm thinking about like, I need to, I, I really should be, you know, spending more time with my kid. But then when I'm spending time with my kid, I'm thinking about how I really need to be working on this project over here. And I'm only half in anything. So be prepared to wear a lot of hats, but also you have to figure out how you're going to manage all those hats. Yep. Um, and if you're finding that you can't 
really give where you need to give, then you need to take some of them off. Um, because again, we're process oriented. We are thinking long term. This is not going to come tomorrow. And you, if you're, if you can accept that, if you can accept that this outcome is not going to come tomorrow, then you shouldn't have a problem taking your time to get there. Um, and so that that would be, I guess, is number two. Um, and then I guess to go along with that one, to go along with that that uh, one really prioritize the things that matter, okay? So when you ultimately screw it up and have to take a hat off, because we all will, um, especially if you are kind of in that entrepreneurial, starting your own clinic and you know doing this whole thing, um, you're eventually gonna have to take a hat off, prioritize what matters the most um, and be like, brut you need to be brutally honest with yourself, but non-judgmental. And recognize um, where that is. So like for me, um, I had to prioritize home first. That has to be there because if I'm not, if I'm not there, I can't be, I can't be fully engaged in anything. And so I have to be fully engaged there first so that I can then go and give myself everywhere else. Then you know, and if you don't have a, if, you know, if you're single and don't have a family and everything yet, then that might not be as much of a, as much of a thing for you yet. Um, but you have to figure out where, where do you have to be engaged in order to engage in everything else in your life? So that's, that, those would be my three process oriented. Okay. Be prepared to wear a lot of hats and then prioritize what matters most so that you know, which one to wear. Those are Great piece of advice. And I agree with you 110% because I'm there, right? I'm juggling multiple hats and I just started the podcast and I took an entire month and a half off because like I'm doing too much. I need to slow down a little bit. Um, but what I truly respect about you, I know to each other, this is the first time we're meeting face to face and we've spoken a few times is you've given us a real life example with yourself every single time. Our topic of discussion was acute injury and you brought a real life example with yourself. Your piece of advice, you brought a real life face and it takes a lot of respect and courage for people to come out and open up to us so we can really learn from it and that's why I started my podcast was using people that I followed I've watched and I viewed to teach the people certain aspects of life um, and I agree prioritizing is something that in today's world we don't really do well we want to do everything everyone wants to be a superstar on social media everyone wants to be a teacher everyone wants to do xyz but you're you're going half ass at everything it's not going to be great um, I, I thank you again for coming on in the mix of a busy life for you to, to, to educate and seriously drop some knowledge on us. Um, I wish you a speedy recovery and I hope that I can bring you thank on you. soon um, again for that. And with that, folks, we will catch uh, Dr. Jacob on another episode. Again, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Oh, you love.